Okay, thank you so much, Stella, for that very warm welcome. Um, Lani, Archie and I are delighted to be here tonight to present um, some of the findings from quite a complex project that we undertook um, to map inclusive pedagogy across Scotland's initial teacher education courses. And as Stella said, um, we, we are the subgroup who um, worked on data analysis and writing papers from this, but it was very much a coll coll collaborative, collaborative effort. Okay. Um, so um, you've hopefully got the chat box up on your screen. Um, if you do have questions or discussion points, um, please do write those into the chat box and um, there'll be plenty of time once we've gone through the slides to have a really good discussion with everybody. Um, so we, we may have a wee bit of time to talk about the National Framework for Inclusion, which is currently being updated, um, but we'll, we'll see how we're doing. Um, I think one of, the bit, one of the really important things to mention is that the, the data that came from our courses, um, it, um, it was, for us, it was really important that, that, we, that we maintained people's confidentiality, so all the data was an, 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 an anonymized. Um, because what we wanted to do through this work was to explore and share good practice and support each other in a non-judgmental way. It absolutely wasn't about um, putting universities and courses under the spotlight and, thing, and, and reviewing them and seeing where they were found wanting. Um, it was very much, what are we doing? Um, how can we support each other? How can we work together collaboratively to strengthen what we are doing across Scotland. So just a wee bit about CIVIC, if you don't know who we are already. Um, we, we now have um, representatives from all 11 universities um, who are involved in initial teacher education in Scotland. At the time of the project, there were only seven universities offering initial teacher education. And um, so we, 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 have, we have grown over, over the past few years. Um, we started back in 2008 and we were originally the, the Scottish Teacher Education Committee Inclusion Group. Um, when, the, when STEC became the Council of Deans, we changed our name as well. Um, and um, the, the group is supported by the Scottish Government and the Scottish Council of Deans of Education. And as I was saying just before, um, we do work collaboratively to ensure that there is coherence in professional learning in inclusive education right across Scotland, wherever we are educating teachers in, in university settings. Um, we were founded as part of a response to, um, there were lots of questions um, back in 2006, seven, eight, around how were, how were new teachers being prepared to teach dyslexic students in school. And it's very similar to more recent conversations around how do we prepare our teachers to teach autistic learners. Um, so it, that, that's, that's where the, the, initial, the initial demand um, for this group came from. And since then, 15 years on, it's very much a self-supporting, um, self-regenerating group. Um, so that's just a wee bit of background about us. Okay, so the framework for inclusion. Um, so this was originally um, developed in 2008. It's very closely linked to the General Teaching Council standards. And because of that, we had the second edition in 2014, and the third edition is currently under, under um, um, it's being, being, being written at the moment. Um, we hope that that will be launched towards the end of the academic session this year. Um, it is a significant piece of work, um, and 
its aim is it's to support initial teacher education and also career and professional learning by having a tool that teachers can take, um, they can reflect on their practice, they can ask themselves or ask in a group the challenge questions to think about how are we meeting learners' needs in various aspects of inclusion, equality and di di diversity. Um, and the framework really, it's underpinned by um, SUIG members really caring that we do have good practice in Scotland. Um, there are a lot of challenges for teachers in Scotland to meet the needs of all of our learners and we're, 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 we're trying to do our part alongside other national partners um, to ensure that teachers feel supported when they work with learners who have additional support needs. So it's very much, th this project is very much part of our work to support colleagues in schools. Um, so we we looked very much at how are the, the framework for inclusion principles, how are they evident in our courses across Scotland? So the, the key messages of the framework are, are very much, um, as, I've, as I've said already, it's about inclusion being every teacher's responsibility. Um, and because it's all of our collective responsibility, it therefore has to be a core part of teacher education, both initial teacher education and career and professional learning. Um, it, it, in, it, in, it involves all learners participating in their learning community, not only in the classroom, but across school, school life. And it's based on an open-ended view of a child's capacity to learn. And the framework, as I said before, it's designed to support teacher education for in in inclusion. So, oh. Sorry, my screen just went completely blank then. Um, my apologies. Um, okay, so we're going to move into talking about the national project and I'm hoping very much that my internet will not fall over with the wind, um, but I'm about to hand on to Archie who's going to take us through the background to the research design. Thank you very much Diane and uh, thank you for having us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the background to our research approach and our research design, how we went about um, producing the findings that we'll, uh, we'll talk about later on. So the, the 2014 uh, National Framework for Inclusion is designed in such a way that it provides sufficient flexibility to enable each university to design their own distinctive ITE programme appropriate to their context. So for example, each IT programme is at liberty to draw from a range of theoretical ideas and professional experiences, design courses aimed at preparing new teachers for inclusive practices. Well, the result of this flexibility is a complex landscape of initial teacher education provision. Initial teacher education in Scotland can be linked by claims to be guided by the framework for inclusion. And this is what the Scottish Universities and Inclusion Group was interested in finding out whether and how the principles of the framework for inclusion are embedded within initial teacher education. So to this end, we embarked on a mapping exercise uh, to map practice across each of the ITE providers in Scotland. Could we move to the next slide, please, Dan? Thank you. So in response, I, I'm sorry, Archie, it seems that you're muted. There we go. That's fine. Thank you. So uh, in response to the complexity associated with the many different ideas and approaches to preparing teachers to work inclusively, we turned to the Council of Europe tool uh, to upgrade teacher education practices for inclusive education. And this was designed by Holland Wenger, Pantic and Florian in 2015. The Council of Europe tool, as shown on this slide, uses an activity model that can be applied to examine the range of activities that are taking place in varied teacher education contexts. Consequently, it offers a useful way of exploring how inclusion is addressed within different course structures and programmes. 
The Council of Europe tool uses five uh, questions to help highlight the main components of an activity. These are um, highlighted in the yellow box. So question one, who does it? That's the subject of the activity and refers to the person or the people that is or are carrying out that particular activity. Question two, what is done, focuses on the object of the activity and refers to who or what the activity is directed towards. Question three, what, why or what is it done for? The outcome of the activity refers to all wanted and unwanted results or impacts that are created as a result of carrying out the activity. Question four, how is it done? The tools and the instruments refers to the physical and cognitive tools or methods that are used to carry out the activity. And question five, where is it done? Is the social and or the physical context and refers to the characteristics of the social setting or environment in which the activity is carried out. Can we move to the next slide, please, Diane? So um, the Council of Europe tool provided us with the sort of structure to begin to um, collect data. And for the purposes of data collection, the members of the Scottish U Universities Inclusion Group are considered the research team at the respective universities. Uh, and following ethical approval uh, from each school of education, teacher educators and each participating university were invited to identify activities associated with inclusive practice from their ITE provision and to provide a description of that activity. Participation was voluntary and our approach to data management and organisation followed the seven steps um, based on uh, uh, the approach designed by Gail et al. in 2013. Step one uh, involved us um, extracting data. So we sourced our data from field notes, interviews and course documentation. Audio recordings of the interviews were used to supplement field notes when necessary rather than producing full transcripts of each interview. Step two then involved the group familiarising ourselves with the data. We have read and reread our field notes and course documentations until we became familiar with the data set. We then moved to a coding uh, process and the, the research teams from each of the universities worked collaboratively to standardise an approach to coding. Initially codes were developed to ensure a common understanding and language for describing practice across each of the settings. The research teams then independently applied the codes to their data, taking care to note any new codes or data which didn't fit the initial analytical frame. As these activities were discussed during each of the Scottish University Inclusion Group meetings, a more refined understanding of how the Council of Europe tool uh, could be applied emerged. Step four. Um, involved us developing a working analytical framework uh, and as the research teams worked independently the analytical framework was subjected to critique by a colleague who was a, not a member of the Scottish Universities Inclusion Group. Codes were discussed in terms of why they'd been interpreted as meaningful and what they told us about the research participants views. These discussions contributed to the final analytical framework and also enabled an exploration of how the analytical framework might be useful for internal reflection and how the concept of inclusion is covered in specific ITE programmes. And in an effort to provide further analytical purchase, we further coded the data relating to intended outcomes against the three principles of inclusive pedagogy that informed the national framework uh, for inclusion. And at this point in the study, a cross university team reviewed the data to ensure consistency in how the data was recorded and then was met, then member checked by each of the research teams. Step five uh, involved as applying our analytical framework. Uh, and so each of the teams applied the agreed analytical framework to the whole data set. Any issues arising were discussed as a standing item at the Scottish Universities Inclusive Group meetings. And these included difficulties in scheduling interviews with busy colleagues, how to capture data when courses and programmes were undergoing review or being revised. A decision was taken not to limit data collection. So a decision was taken to limit data collection to one academic year, 2018-19, and accept that the data collected would represent a best effort, but one that would be incomplete. Step six, we charted the data onto a framework matrix. Uh, this, for this, we used an Excel spreadsheet to tabulate the data. Data were entered by course for each question in the Council of Europe activity tool, and that enabled us to document how issues of inclusion were covered. We 
didn't include all the data that we had collected as we weren't counting the number of times a key point emerged. Rather, the focus was in selecting data that was illustrative of each course. And we aimed to strike a balance between data reduction and capturing the essence of the original meanings. And step seven involved us interpreting the data. So all of the research teams were able to document practice within programs and courses and identify practice aligned with the expectations set by the National Framework for Inclusion. The time constraints uh, of the research meant that it was impossible to obtain information from all who might have contributed. However, the available data enabled us to produce a set of maps uh, that begin to chart the landscape of teacher education practices. And we refer to these maps as audit maps. And we can see an example of an audit map in the next slide. So each of the boxes here um, represents uh, an aspect of the Council of Europe tool. So each audit map comprises boxes linked to each of the questions in our version of the Council of Europe tool. For example, in this audit map, we can see under the category of the teacher that the activity was taught by a range of persons, such as the programme director, course coordinators, tutors with expertise specific to the early years, and university-based specialists from social work by way of illustration. Also for the category curriculum, examples such as research and inquiry as a key driver and modelling inclusive ways of working throughout provide some illustration of the types of data recorded. So with the data we collected, we were able to produce 18 of these maps. I'm now going to pass on to Lani, who's going to tell you a little bit more about our findings from this part of the project. Thanks, Archie. Um, and I'm also going to try to unpack those maps a little bit um, as well. So I'm going to back up ever so slightly um, and just kind of recall something that Diane said when she was talking about the framework, uh, the National Framework for Inclusion, which is tied and aligned with the GTCS standards for professional practice. And that is that the theoretical idea of inclusion that we think is so important in initial teacher education and career long professional learning, but particularly initial teacher education is this notion that every child's capacity to learn is open ended. And that what teachers do matters. And that in part is why, you know, the, this work is the responsibility of every teacher taking on board the fact that there will be many differences between learners and those need to be accounted for as well. And sometimes that will involve the like the, the um, uh, relying on specialist knowledge or the need to bring specialist knowledge to bear on how a child is taught. Um, so we try to embed that as just a norm in the way that we think about how should inclusion be understood in Scotland for any child. So we have these three principles of inclusive pedagogy that we've been referring to, but we haven't really said what they are. Um, although they, they were uh, in italics on Archie's map and I'll show you another map in a minute. So you'll see it again. Um, but that is the notion that differences, difference is ordinary and we should expect that there'll be differences between learners. Uh, on the difficulties that children might encounter in learning are challenges for teachers. They're not problems within children. You know, they're, 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 it's a teacher, you know, that, that notion of what the teacher does matters. Um, and the way that the teacher works with the child has everything to do with the extent to which the child will feel that they belong in the classroom or that they're included. Um, but that doing this work is really challenging work and it requires collaboration with others, particularly with specialists when a child's um, uh, in a situation where they're struggling to such an extent that the teacher feels that they need to bring in additional resources. So that's kind of the theoretical overview. And when we talk about teacher education for inclusion, and when we talk about the national framework and aligning that theoretical idea of inclusion, we think about how do we prepare teachers to meet the standards of the, na the national standards um, that are set out by the GTCS, but in ways that are faithful uh, to the principles of an inclusive approach to teaching with the idea that so that more children can have a better experience of learning in school. Uh, so that that's the, the the kind of the thrust of this. And as many of you will know, who if you've worked with the framework or seen it, we try to do that in a question based way so that it encourages reflective practice. It allows the flexibility that Archie was mentioning in terms of the differences between our programs. 
but that also, as Archie mentioned, creates a messy kind of landscape. And then we in the SUIG group get together. And one of the questions we regularly ask ourselves is, how are we doing what we say we're doing? We've got this framework. We all use it. Um, we have other um, uh, tools on, and other things that are available to us that we integrate into our programs or other things that we're required or asked to do that have to do with specialist knowledge. Are we using those things? How are we using them? Where are they, we using them? Does it make a difference if we do it early or late in the program? You know, we ask ourselves those kinds of questions all the time. And so in a way, you know, trying to find a strategy that would in, as Archie, I think, or someone said, in a non-judgmental way, just examine that, you know, just to give ourselves some feedback um, to answer that question of, are we doing what we say we're doing and how well are we doing it? Uh, and so the, the project that Archie just outlined to you um, in great detail was our um, attempt to do that. And we did that in, in uh, you know, in part because the actual research literature on this work is not that well developed. Um, there is research, you know, there's a lot of research on teacher education, but the kinds of knowledge that we need, robust knowledge about the actual content of programs, how it's embedded, and the impact that that has on the practices of teachers is quite challenging to do methodologically. And so we use this tool in a way to help us clarify and be able to look in a relational way at what we're doing, taking account that we're all doing it slightly differently. And so what we found um, is that this map making metaphor was really helpful to us because we got a partial landscape. We knew, uh, and I think Archie mentioned, we collected data, it was a massive data collection effort and people were fantastic in terms of contributing. But we were also aware because it was almost a, an act of self-study that we didn't capture everything. We knew things that didn't show up in the data set that we actually knew were practices that were occurring in our programs. Um, but we hadn't been able to ca capture them because there was it, the, of the complexity of our teacher education programs and the, the, um, the range of people on expertise that come in um, and uh, et cetera. So this mapping was helping us to draw a picture of what does this look like in our practice? So it was creating something for us that we would be able to examine and then reflect on. Um, and so we loved this um, idea of a map because we know as map makers that you know, they're not perfect and you get your, your contours. And then as you get as you generate more knowledge or you, you learn more about the landscape, you can improve that map and you can fill it in with greater detail, et cetera. And because we were in such uncharted territory, we thought, let's just begin to map this. Let's see what the landscape looks like. And I'm just delighted. And, and I thought this was amazing. This is um, Bira's research intelligence for, this is the current issue, um, you know, just out now. And what does it say, but mapping education, mapping the discipline. You know, so this notion of, you know, taking stock of what we know and what we still need to know is really important right now. And there's a great article by Ian Mentor here on the future of teacher education, where he's really calling for the kind of re research, you know, the, the quality of research about the content of our programs that we're trying to do in this project. So um, I think this is timely um, from, from that point of view. So in our drawing of the landscape, we used um, an idea from mathematics education that there were these components in a landscape of big ideas, strategies, and models. So for us, in terms of the framework for inclusion, the cross program working that we do, um, the collaborative work that we do, our landscape component of a big idea is inclusive pedagogy. The difference is ordinary, difficulties are challenges, collaboration is essential kind of ideas. Um, the strategies um, are the distinctive approach of each university. That Glasgow is different from Strathclyde, is different from Aberdeen, is different from Dundee, Edinburgh, et cetera. Um, and that the models are the programs within our universities, the B.Ed. program, the PGDE programs, M.Ed. programs, the many different kinds of programs that, that we have. Um, so by 
by mapping this, it helps us to disentangle something that's very complex and, and um, difficult to get your head around um, or do research on because of the complexity. And so what we found in doing this and using the kind of maps that Archie showed you, and I'll show you another one in a minute, was that we had these, we were able to draw some landmarks. We know that our map is imperfect and partial, but it is something that gets us started and keeps us going. Uh, you know, so what we found are big landmarks, like this, these are the, the big takeaway messages from where we are today with this, is that there are methodological mountains to climb in terms of being able to obtain quality data, analyzing the data, um, you know, getting busy teacher educators to even generate data, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, and then there are content gaps. So even in with the, the, the snapshot that we got in the academic year where we collected our data, we were able, and, and I think this was something that answered our question of, are we doing what we say we're doing? You know, we've aligned our theoretical approach to inclusion to the teacher education standards how, you know, what are we doing? What, what does that actually look like when we map this? And one of the things that we found is that we were covering, we were spending more time on some things than other things. So for example, we were pretty good on the um, concept of the child of an open app, uh, ended capacity to learn and really like bringing that message home. And I think if we go to the next slide, Diane, we can start to see some of this. I hope that um, you can, we can, I don't, I don't know how well you can read this, but I will talk you through this. Um, uh, so we see on this map, we've got, if you look at the far left-hand box, that is, we've got the teacher, you know, that who question, who is doing this, the teacher educator. Um, and in this case, it was, um, internal subject specialists and external subject specialists. So lots of us will have our lecturer um, of whatever, but we'll also be bringing in someone from the community, someone who's a, you know, a, a, maybe a, a um, additional support teacher in school or someone from one of the um, uh, uh, um, advocacy groups or, you know, uh, you know, someone external will come in and also be providing inputs for um, students. And the context for where these inputs were happening, if you look at the box to the right, um, on the bottom was in lectures, tutorials, in group work, in placements. You know, there were lots of places where we could see examples of the um, uh, inclusive pedagogical approach in action within our programs. And if you go up one, the how of that were some of the things that the um, activities that the teacher educators and that includes the external, you know, sub subject um, uh, specialists might be doing, whether they were um, using a team teaching model, whether they were um, uh, using critical discussion, you know, what were the pedagogical tools that they were using as teacher educators to impart this knowledge, content knowledge within the different contexts where it was occurring. And of course, on the, the what of this in, this, in this case is, you know, what is the teacher, who is the, the teacher educator is the who in the model, but, but their focus is that the what is the learner, the student teacher, um, the students on the course is, you know, that, that what they're trying to do is use these tools and artifacts in different contexts to impart the contact knowledge about inclusive pedagogy so that the outcome, the why at the, the, the very end of this map will be the kinds of things that they were doing within that course to bring life, you know, to, to make meaning out of that theoretical idea about differences and challenges and collaboration. Um, and that's what we're talking about when we say we're mapping the landscape, we're trying to understand, are we doing what we say we're doing? Um, and it's enabling us to say, well, we, you know what, we're covering, we're doing, we've got a lot of coverage on differences ordinary. And, you know, we're doing that in really interesting ways. But we were, I think, um, a little bit um, taken aback to see that we were not doing as much as we thought we were on collaboration. So this has been like a really excellent um, uh, reflective 
uh, activity for ourselves, in addition to mapping the landscape, we're, get, we're getting this immediate feedback of there are some gaps here. You know, there's some valleys that are pretty deep that maybe we need to be um, thinking about, you know, how do we redress that? Where in our programs can we make sure that we can get a little more coverage on this issue because it's just so important. And we're actually, we're a little bit surprised that we weren't doing as much as we thought that we were or that we'd like to think that we are. Um, so I think that these, um, uh, uh, you know, it's important um, for us as teacher educators to hold our own feet to the fire about the kinds of things that we think is our responsibility in making sure that the teachers who come onto our programs are qualified and you know have the confidence to do when they get out into school um and this just becomes you know part of that continuous feedback continuous and formative feedback to ourselves and improvement so if we go to the next slide please diane um we had a, a couple of other out, outcomes you know again that were um um, in, in some ways, not necessarily specific to the mapping, but they were incidental things that were occurring at the same time, because some of us were able to also get data from our students. Um, not everyone was able to do that, but where we did get it, what we found, which was very reassuring to us, was that the students seemed committed to inclusion, you know, that they get it. When we're, when we're doing our job, they're getting it, and they're going out into school and um, schools um, placements and coming back with really good examples of, of, of practice. You know, and they want to come back and say, is that it? Am, am I doing that right? Um, and that kind of thing. Uh, they, and they, they, they see those connections between the university-based modules and the professional practice um, aspect of their programs. So they, they, they see they, they see those connections, um, you know, and again, that's what we hope for. So it's reassuring when, when they generate that feedback for us. Um, so what we think is as well is that the inclusive pedagogy as we've been defining it in the SUIG group and inclusive practices, they are recognized by students as being present, but there also was, we felt, more work that we could do to increase the visibility of those practices, because very often they are there in school, but they're not named. Um, and so they're implicit in practice, but because this work is so challenging and there's so many barriers to um, uh, ensuring that good practice is available to all children at all times, um, that I think we think there's more that we can do to make it more explicit. You know, the, like it's great that it's implicitly there. We think, you know, there is a lot of commitment to inclusion in Scotland, but there's, we can do more. We could do a little better, I think, is what, and, I, and my colleagues will correct me if I, or add to what I'm saying if they, um, you know, uh, on that one. But I think that, um, you know, we have that sense that it's implicit and, we're asking ourselves, you know, what's our job in helping to make that more explicit. Um, so our reflections, the last outcome, a uh, last slide, please, Diane, is that the project has been an absolutely fantastic opportunity for us to work collaboratively. And I think one of the things that we have always worked really hard to do is to be very um, supportive of each other to not see our universities as in competition for students, but to see our work as part of a national network of universities that are ensuring that every teacher has is, is as skilled and as open to the ideas of diversity and um, uh, uh, pupil differences, et cetera, and sees the responses to those as an integral part of the work that they do as a teacher. Um, it strengthens our relationships within the group. We continue to meet three times a year. It's been virtual lately and we're missing our in-person meetings, but we, if anything, are meeting more because we're meeting virtually and we're also revising the, the framework to align with the new standard. So there's been a lot of work this year, but again, it's been really good for our own professional development. Um, and the work, um, uh, you know, it was complex we are aware of the limitations of it and the um we wouldn't we don't want to overclaim from what we've done but we also know that what we've done is created some insights that we would never have if we hadn't done this work so we're 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 glad that we stuck with it 
Um, it's given us deeper insights into inclusive pedagogy and practice. Um, and I think led to improved learning about the aspects of our course, um, of courses that we are in our programs, but we don't teach on them. So this kind of activity for us as a professional group enables us to, you know, learn more about what our colleagues that we, you know, see over coffee are actually doing and understanding the activities that they're, they're using and um, help us all think about how they're working and whether or not they should be modified. I'm going to stop there um, just to give, make sure that we have time for some questions. Um, I know we covered a lot in a very short period of time. I hope it was coherent. Um, and I hope that you will, um, you know, uh, ask us some questions or just share your thoughts and reactions um, or ideas uh, about the work and, you know, where we might go with it.